46 years ago today, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald sank in Lake Superior. All 29 crew members aboard died. They called her the pride of the American side. At over 700 feet long, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald was a steel behemoth, thought to be unsinkable. But on a stormy November night, she was swallowed whole by Lake Superior, sparking a 50-year debate over what went wrong. Look at that. It's just totally, just completely shredded. Mangled, yeah. yeah. It's like no man's land. I didn't realize just how severe the damage was in between the two sections. Look. Now that debate may finally be over. An underwater drone equipped with 4K cameras and AI scanners has just completed the most detailed survey of the wreck in history. The findings are not just shocking, they expose a fatal design secret that turned the mighty freighter into a death trap from the inside out. A legend in the making. In the 1950s, America was building giants, and on the Great Lakes, no giant was bigger or prouder than the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. When she was launched in 1958, bells rang and crowds cheered. At 729 feet long, longer than two football fields, and weighing over 13,000 tons empty, she was the largest freshwater freighter ever built, a true marvel of engineering. They called her the Mighty Fitz, the pride of the American side, and even the queen of the lakes. Her job was to haul taconite iron ore pellets from the mines of Minnesota to the steel mills near Detroit. And for 17 years, she did it better than any other ship. The thing nobody tells you is that a ship like the Fitz becomes more than just a machine. It develops a personality. She was known for her speed, often breaking records for cargo hauls. Tourists would gather on the shorelines just to watch her glide past, her powerful horn echoing across the water. On board, she was a place of deep pride for her crew. Many sailors spent their entire careers on her decks, loyal to the vessel that provided their livelihood. Her final captain, Ernest McSorley, was a seasoned veteran of the lakes with over 40 years of experience. He was a quiet, respected man who knew the water better than his own backyard. He trusted the Fitz, and his crew trusted him. Many people are crazy about these old legends, and for good reason. These weren't just jobs, they were a way of life. But not all things are what they seem. The Great Lakes are notoriously treacherous, especially late in the season. The sailors have a name for the violent November storms that can whip up without warning. The Witch of November. These storms can produce hurricane-force winds and waves as tall as three-story buildings. The Fitzgerald had weathered countless storms before. Her reputation was spotless. She had never had a serious accident in her 17 years of service. To put it mildly, she was considered a rock, an unsinkable titan. On November 9, 1975, the Fitz loaded over 26,000 tons of iron ore in Superior, Wisconsin, destined for a steel mill near Detroit. The weather forecast was grim predicting a nasty storm brewing over the plains. But this was routine for November. Captain McSorley consulted with the captain of another freighter nearby, the Arthur M. Anderson, and they agreed to travel together across the vast expanse of Lake Superior, keeping an eye on each other. As the Fitz pulled away from the dock, no one could have possibly known it was her final journey. It was just another trip, another storm to conquer. The most shocking fact is, within 36 hours, this celebrated ship and its entire crew of 29 men would simply cease to exist. The journey was a descent into a maritime nightmare. No Mayday, No Survivors The storm that hit Lake Superior on November 10, 1975, was more ferocious than anyone predicted. Winds howled at over 80 miles per hour and waves swelled to a monstrous 35 feet. Snow and freezing spray blasted through the air, reducing visibility to almost zero. The Fitzgerald and the Anderson were fighting for their lives, tossed around by the lake's fury. Throughout the afternoon, Captain McSorley remained in radio contact with the Anderson. You see, even in these conditions, his voice was reportedly calm, the voice of a man who had seen it all before. Around 3.30 in the afternoon, McSorley radioed the Anderson with a concerning update. We have a bad list, he said, meaning the ship was tilting. He also reported that they had lost a couple of vent covers and that a railing had been damaged. He specifically requested the Anderson keep tracking them as the Fitzgerald's own radar had been knocked out. Despite the damage, he assured them the ship's pumps were handling the water. The last communication from the Edmund Fitzgerald came at approximately 7.10 that evening. 
the Anderson radio to ask how they were doing. McSorley's final words were, we are holding our own. Minutes later, the blip representing the 729-foot freighter vanished from the Anderson's radar screen. There was no mayday call. No distress flares were ever seen. The ship, loaded with 26,000 tons of ore and carrying 29 souls, simply disappeared. The immediate search found nothing but a few lifeboats and rafts, all empty and damaged, floating in the churning water. It was as if the lake had opened up and swallowed the Titan whole. What followed was one of the most intense investigations in maritime history, sparking a debate that would last for half a century. The wreck was located a few days later, resting in 530 feet of water. The most shocking fact is that it was in two large pieces. The bow section sat upright in the mud, while the stern was upside down about 170 feet away. How could a ship this massive break in half without a single cry for help? The official Coast Guard report concluded that the most probable cause was flooding through ineffective hatch closures. They theorized the massive waves washed over the deck, collapsing the hatch covers and allowing thousands of gallons of water to pour into the cargo holds, pulling the bow down until the stress snapped the ship in two. What many overlooked, however, was that this theory implicitly blamed the crew for not securing the hatches properly, a conclusion the sailors' families and the maritime community fiercely rejected. Other theories emerged. Maybe she struck an uncharted shoal, tearing a gash in her hull, or perhaps she was hit by a rogue wave, a trio of massive waves that overwhelmed her in seconds. For decades, without clear evidence, the sinking of the Fitz remained a chilling ghost story, a legend immortalized in song, but a mystery at its heart. That mystery was about to be met with 21st century eyes. Secrets in the Silt. Nearly 50 years after the Fitzgerald vanished, a new expedition set out to its final resting place. This wasn't another dive with grainy cameras. This was a high-tech forensic investigation. The team used a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, essentially a sophisticated underwater drone. This machine was a marvel, equipped with an array of sensors, high-powered lights that could pierce the eternal darkness of the lake bed, and 4K ultra-high-definition cameras. It was designed for one purpose to capture the wreck in more detail than ever before and hopefully to let the ship itself tell the story of its final moments. As the ROV descended, the control room on the surface vessel was silent, all eyes glued to the monitors. Down it went through 530 feet of frigid black water. The pressure at that depth is immense, over 230 pounds per square inch. Then, out of the murky gloom, a colossal shape emerged, it was the bow of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The footage was breathtakingly clear and haunting. The ship's name was still faintly visible on the steel. The drone glided over the deck, revealing twisted metal and silt covering every surface like a shroud. You can see this everywhere in old wrecks, but the state of the Fitz was different. It didn't look like it had exploded. It looked like it had been bent and broken by an unimaginable force. The primary mission was to examine the cargo hatches the focus of the 50-year-old debate. The drone moved slowly over hatch number one. According to the original design, each of the 21 massive hatch covers should have been secured by dozens of heavy-duty steel clamps. These clamps were the only thing keeping the lake out. The camera zoomed in, its lights illuminating a single clamp handle, then another. But then the operator spotted something that made everyone in the control room lean forward. A clamp was missing not just loose, but gone. The steel where it should have been was bare. The thing nobody tells you is that in a forensic investigation, you look for patterns. One missing clamp could be an anomaly. But as the drone continued its survey, the shocking picture became clear. On hatch after hatch, more clamps were missing. Some were bent backward at grotesque angles as if they had been peeled off by a giant can opener. The footage provided undeniable proof the hatch covers, the ship's primary defense against the storm, had been systematically compromised. The original Coast Guard theory was no longer just a theory, but the drone was about to find something even more damning, a smoking gun that pointed to a silent, terrifying killer. This discovery would prove the crew never stood a chance. The smoking gun at 500 feet. The pattern of missing and damaged hatch clamps was a horrifying revelation, but it was what the drone found next that truly terrified the investigators. 
While examining the forward section of the wreck near the battered hatches, the drone's high-definition cameras focused on a circular opening on the deck. It was the base of an air vent, a pipe designed to allow air to escape the cargo holds as they were filled. But the pipe itself was gone, completely sheared off as if by a colossal can opener. What remained was a gaping four-inch diameter hole leading directly into the cavernous heart of the ship. This wasn't just a small leak, it was a death wound. The engineers on the research vessel immediately began running simulations. In a storm with 35-foot waves, a common occurrence in a November gale on Lake Superior, a hole this size, combined with the compromised hatch covers, would allow water to pour into the cargo hold at an astonishing rate, potentially thousands of gallons per minute. This confirmed a key detail from Captain Ernest McSorley's final radio calls. He had mentioned losing vent covers. But what he likely didn't know, and couldn't have known from the relative calm of the pilot house, was the sheer volume of water surging into a ship, deep below the decks where no one could see it. The most shocking fact is that the SS Edmund Fitzgerald was likely flooding long before the crew realized the severity of the situation. The 26,000 tons of taconite iron ore pellets in its hold would have acted like a sponge, absorbing much of the initial water ingress and masking the growing deadly weight in the bow. This chilling detail explains why McSorley's last message was so calm. From his perspective on the bridge, the ship was handling the storm, albeit with a list. He was, in his own words, holding his own. In reality, the bow was getting heavier and heavier with every passing minute, slowly dipping deeper into the churning waves. It was a slow and silent drowning and the crew was completely, tragically unaware. This new evidence paints a chilling picture of the ship's final moments. As the bow sank lower, it would have acted like a massive scoop, forcing the ship to nosedive into an oncoming wave. The immense stress of the heavy waterlogged bow diving while the stern was still being lifted by a following wave would have been catastrophic. The ship didn't just break, it was torn apart by the fundamental laws of physics. The drone footage finally provided the visual evidence to back this up, turning a half century of speculation into a concrete minute-by-minute -minute timeline of disaster. It absolved the crew of blame for not securing the hatches and instead pointed to a much more terrifying culprit. The ship itself was fatally flawed, its steel likely weakened by decades of stress. And yet, even with this compelling evidence, wilder theories persist, born from the sheer violence and speed of the sinking. Some marine theorists whisper of a phenomenon known as a rogue siege wave, a standing wave that can build to monstrous heights in an enclosed body of water like Lake Superior. This wouldn't be just a single rogue wave, but a series of three, the infamous Three Sisters that could have overwhelmed the Fitzgerald the first two waves washing over the deck, and the third final wave delivering the crushing blow that drove it under. Others point to more outlandish, almost esoteric possibilities. Could the storm's specific frequency have created a harmonic resonance within the Fitzgerald's long hull, causing the steel to vibrate itself into structural failure? It's a concept straight from theoretical physics, suggesting the storm didn't just batter the ship, but played it like a fatally flawed instrument. More fringe ideas delve into the known magnetic anomalies of the Lake Superior Basin. Could a sudden, intense, geomagnetic fluctuation have not only knocked out the ship's electronics, but also exerted a bizarre torsional force on the massive steel vessel? It's a theory that borders on science fiction, but one that attempts to explain the inexplicable speed of the disappearance. In this version of events, the sheared vent isn't from a wave, but from an immense unseen force twisting the vessel from below, a prelude to the lake swallowing it whole. The official report may point to flooding, but the legend of the Fitzgerald, fueled by these unsettling questions, suggests that the Witch of November may have had help from something far stranger. The Fitz's secrets are finally revealed, but does knowing how it happened make the tragedy any less haunting? Let us know your thoughts below. Don't forget to like and subscribe.